Yeah. So everyone, yeah. Uh, just, uh, we should probably get started. So it's it's already uh, late eleven, so that's the starting time. So um, so just allow me to give a, a brief introduction uh, to the speaker today, is Marie. So uh, basically, um, so so for so if you just know me, and I I give a talk. Uh, I'm different too, but but I give a talk about the the, the, the autonomous vehicle stuff. Uh, in the in the first uh, le seminar in this um, in this uh, seminar uh, series, and Maria and I are pretty good friends uh, since a very long time for, for for many years. So she's always pretty good in research. Uh, so she just get uh, her uh, uh, PhD from um, uh, it's, it should be this year, right? This year, it's a graduate PhD from University of Alabama, and she's a uh, uh, expert in uh, 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 authentication uh, system security. Uh, user um, less than their less security, so she had a lot. And she has a very impressive uh, publication uh, record uh, with lots of security, uh, top tier security on conference publications in CCS, NDCS. You guys know the names, and then uh, she also got lots of the research awards uh, from the university, and then and also she also have lots of this um, this, this political uh, impact from the news articles. And also, uh, I think there are some interviews. Uh, uh, I, I, I think I saw, uh, so uh, I guess just very recently um, about your recent work. Uh, so I'm I'm really glad that she decided to join the visa research as a research scientist. So uh, I can uh, so bring more op opportunities in collaboration or in this full time or in, in this internship opportunity to to UCI. Um, so it's a pretty good opportunity. So as far as I, I know, so um, so I guess she'll be meeting with, stu with students uh, in two uh this afternoon in the room of four zero one three. So if you guys are interested, uh, please do come and 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 I talk to her in person. So just two to three p.m. Uh, it's the room of four zero one three in this building. So yeah, today she'll be talking about her recent research uh, in the uh, device authentication. So I'll just give the floor to her. Thank you, Alfred. So, I'm Aliha, and today I will talk about some of my research in the area of secure authentication. Actually, some of this work, and many of them, is in collaboration with UC Irvine. Uh, my PhD advisor graduated from UC Irvine, so we had a very good collaboration with UC Irvine while I was back at UAB. And now I'm hoping to have the same collaboration when I join Visa. Um, you might know Visa by now. <laughs> you either have the credit card or you know that Visa is not a financial company, it's a global payment technology company. Um, and part of, Visa, part of Visa is Visa Research uh, that was established about three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, with the goal of driving the long term technology research at Visa. So we are not looking just at what is happening right now in the payment industry that's part of Visa, but we are looking at what's going to happen in the future, like in terms of if, if and when post-quantum computing become a thing, or if and when uh, cryptocurrency is becoming an important thing. We are trying to look at that. Uh, there are three main research areas, data analytics, security. In security, we have cryptography, and we have um, system security, and I'm associated with the system security team. And we also have the blockchain team. Currently, we are about 30 full-time research scientists at Visa Research, and we're going to expand this to double in size by end of 2019. So we're hiring many um, research scientists in 2019, and almost equal number of people as interns. Some of us, like me, are new grads, and some are the folks from IBM Research, uh, Microsoft Research, Google, and other industrial research lab. Today I'm going to talk about uh, secure authentication and then at the end of the talk I will just um, briefly talk about some of the research projects that is going on at Visa Research. So if any of you are interested, you can talk to your advisors, you can talk to your professors and start a collaboration in that area or you can join as intern or full-time research scientist there. As all of us know, authentication is one of the most crucial aspects of almost any system deployed today. It's the process of proving to a verifier that the prover is in fact who he or she claims to be. It may happen locally or remotely, but in almost any case, the user is an important part of the system. 
either acting as a prover in human to machine verification, for example, when you authenticate with your password to a web service, or user may act as a prover and a verifier in human to human verification, for example, when we talk to each other and we recognize each other by the voice, or user may act as a facilitator in case of um, network authentication, for example, when we are authenticating a machine to machine, user acts as a facilitator here. So this involvement of the user in the process of authentication shows the importance of having systems that are not just secure, but also usable. Not because we want the system to be very easy and smooth for the users, but also because usability uh, impacts the security directly. Um, if you make the systems very, very usable, you may compromise the security. And if you make it very, very secure, uh, then users just may give up because it's not usable enough. Several authentication schemes have been proposed that use one or several of the factors, such as something you know, something you are, or something you have, to make uh, the authentication protocols more secure. But uh, as a prime example of something you know, we have the passwords. Our passwords suffer from several well-documented problems. Like uh, they are due to the uh, human memory issue, they're either weak and non-random, and then a good target for the attack, or when they become very strong and high entropy, it becomes difficult to remember them, and it opens other venues of attacks. To address the issues with the password, uh, some approaches have been proposed. One of them is the password manager. Password managers lock the user's password under uh, master password and the user can just input the master password to unlock the passwords associated with different accounts. And another thing that can be used to secure authentication is two-factor authentication, um, that a user's personal device is incorporated in the authentication process. The user should show that he or she knows the password and is in the possession of a device that generates a PIN and this PIN can be verified along with the password. Um, with the server. So this is the topic that we are going to talk about today. Passwords, password managers to secure the two -factor, to secure the password authentication and two-factor authentication to secure the two-factor authentication. But as I said, um, uh, because human is part of this loop, it's usually difficult for the approaches to make a balance between the security and usability. Often systems that try to be very usable, they compromise the security. Or those that try to improve the security, they compromise the usability. And making this balance between the two is not a very trivial and very straightforward task. Uh, what I will present in this paper is um, applied crypto, um, system security, and user-centered security all being incorporated to design systems that are first secure, and these are being proven to be secure, um, like with cryptographic proofs, and also they are usable, like not compromising usability, but at the same time offering the highest level of security possible. As part of that, I will talk about a secure two-factor authentication system. This is also part of that is collaboration with UCR1 and IBM Research. And I will talk about the password manager. So let's uh, get started with the background, what we are talking. So the state of the art of password authentication is a still that user remembers a password. And this password is a stored as hash of the password, a salted hash of the password on the server. Then when, you use it, when the user inputs the password, uh, the server can verify whether the password is correct by referring to the hash of the password on the server. But the problem, as I said, is that users cannot um, remember very high entropy and randomized password, and they pick weak and low entropy password. As a result, an attacker could try to guess the password and get access to the, pa to the server, to whatever service uses that password after multiple uh, run of guessing. So this is what we call online guessing attack. Online guessing attack is a problem that is easier to address. Another problem is offline dictionary attack that the attacker compromises a server and then can uh, build a relatively small dictionary of all possible passwords and try to unlock the password files stored on the uh, server. This attack is a more important attack and several of the current uh, data breaches that you can see are of this type of offline dictionary attack. 
And remember that users reuse their passwords over and over again. They use the same password on multiple accounts. So once one of these servers get compromised, the same password might be used in a different account, which probably might need a higher security, like for example, a financial um, service. And then the same password is there, so that, pass that server is also compromised. So what we are trying to do in our password manager in our two-factor authentication is to address the problem with online guessing attacks and offline dictionary attacks. And offline dictionary attacks is a problem that had not been addressed before using the password managers and two-factor authentication. Um, um, crypto primitive that we use here is called Device Enhanced Password Authenticated Key Exchange Protocol, or in short, DPEG protocol. DPEG protocol is an extension to the PEG protocol. PEG protocol is a protocol that receives a password from the user and stays stored on the server. Using this password generates a key. Using that key, the communication between the client and server can be uh, secured. So we are using an extension of this PEG with a device, with addition of a device here. So we added a smartphone here to the protocol of uh, to the PEG protocol. With this addition, we can make the system secure against online and offline attack as, it, as I will discuss. Apart from the PEG protocol, that can be any PEG protocol here, we have an OPRF protocol, obvious pseudo random function running between the client and the device, the user device, let's say smartphone. <coughs> so what happens is that user inputs a password and device inputs a key. None of these parties, not the client, not the device, they, they don't know about the other input from the other party. The device doesn't know about the password, client doesn't know about the key, but the OPRF protocol generates a randomized password. This randomized password can be input to any page protocol and generate a key. And this key can be used for encrypting or can be used to secure the communication between client and the server. So this is what DPEG is about, and our password manager and our two-factor authentication are based on this DPEG protocol. Uh, the property that we can see here is that because the device doesn't know the password, it's secure against um, offline attacks. And because the client doesn't know about the uh, key, the key is never revealed. And also the communication between the client and the device does not need to be encrypted or secure in any way because none of these inputs are going directly in clear text on this channel. One instantiation of this OPRF protocol is with Port Kaliski Password to Random Protocol. Um, this is a scheme that works over a cyclic group G of uh, prime order Q with generator G, um, but let's, let's make it easy. In, we can assume that this, group, this um, scheme works, let's say, over a curve whatever we're talking, this scheme is a point on the curve. And we have a hash function, is similar to any hash function, H, we call it H. It's, let's say, a SHA-256 function. And we also have another hash function that maps any arbitrary streak to an element of that group. Let's say it receives the password, it returns a point on that curve. So the protocol works by the user inputting the password on the client, the client picks a random row, computes hash of the password. This, is, this hash of the password is an element of that group, let's say a point on the curve. And then we can blind the password by raising hash of the password to the power row. So here what we have is that um, hash of the password to the power row does not show anything about the password. The client submits this to the device. Looking at this channel, the attacker cannot know anything about the password. And then the device can raise it to the power of the key, which is associated with each service. Again, anyone looking at this channel cannot understand what K is. And then on the client side, we can de-blind this value by raising it to the power of row inverse and get the value of hash of the password to the power of key. This hash of the password to the power of key um, does not reveal any information about the password, does not reveal any information about the key, and the generated value RWD is completely randomized and high entropy. So that was the magic that happened, and based on that, we have our password manager and our two-factor authentication. 
the way that the current password managers work is that they are either device-based password, uh, device-based, client-based, or browser-based password managers. They encrypt the passwords on their master password. The user inputs the master password. Uh, the file is un unencrypted, and the password associated with each service is shown to the user. Um, but they store the encrypted password. We also have hash-based password managers. They compute the password on the fly on the input of the master password as hash of the master password. So every time you input password, master password, they compute hash of the master password and they say, okay, here is your password, go and input it on the service. Um, there is one, um, I think with Stanford has one called password hash. But none of these techniques are secure against offline dictionary attacks and that's the reason that we see that several of these password managers have been hacked. What we have is called Sphinx. Uh, it's a password manager that does not store the password. Uh, and that X is no exaggeration. Um, here I will just uh, introduce a design and implementation and usability study of this password manager. So the design of this password manager is that the user inputs a master password. We have a Chrome browser extension that communicates with an Android app on the device. This communication runs the protocol, the OPRF protocol. The result of this OPRF protocol is a randomized high entropy password associated with each service. So the randomized password is transferred to the server. Now if we look at the properties of this protocol is that the password, the master password is just a human memorable password and the user can reuse it over and over again. But this master password is never stored anywhere and is never um, input on the device and is never transferred in clear format anywhere. On the server side, we don't have any modification. We can use it with, let's say, Gmail, Facebook. They don't even need to know that we have this password manager running. Uh, but the password that is associated with each service is completely randomized. This randomization helps to secure uh, the server against offline dictionary attacks. On the, on the device side, we only store K for each service. No password, no master password, nothing is ever stored or is a, or even input on the device. That's why we say it's a password manager that hides the password even from the password manager. You, can, you do not uh, ever store the password or input the password or the master password on this password manager. And so it's secure against offline attacks often compromise of the device. This randomized password is secure against online attacks, and uh, we also combine it with the domain name from which the user is trying to log in, and that makes it even secure against phishing attacks. We had an implementation of this, and actually we have another implementation, um, again with the help of one of the students at UC Irvine, um, we have an online version and we have the device version. So the device version of this implementation has a Chrome browser extension, an Android app, and the communication between the browser extension and the app is over uh, Google Cloud Messaging. So as I said, we made a system that is secure, that never stores the password, and is secure against the online attacks, and is secure against offline attacks. Now we want to know that whether this system is also usable and is practical um, if we, let's say, we want to use it in daily um, usage. So we ran a usability study to understand whether this system is transparent, secure, and how the perception of security and usability is from the user's point of view. In this study, we asked some users to come to our lab. We actually had a real life study as well, but uh, here I'm just reporting the lab study. We asked the users to come to our lab and answer some questions about their demographic and answer some questions about their background and whether they are familiar with computers, what, how, how, what is the level of their computer skills and their security background. And then we asked them to follow the steps that is needed to activate this service and use this service. First, log in with their own map username and password, then activate the master password with, then activate the system and then change their passwords with the service and log in with this new password and with this new password manager to each of the services. And then we ask uh, several questions at the end of the study. Some of these are standard usability questions 
Uh, some of that are specific to our password manager. The result of this study showed that they generally found the system to be usable and they were satisfied with the system. We have a score of zero to five and they generally found the system, they generally rated the system uh, over four for different metrics that we had here. Except if you look at it, except here that we asked them, how do you find the system uh, usability and how are you satisfied with the system when you log in with a randomized password? And this is low and that is the reason that we want to improve the system with our password manager. So that shows that if they log in with a uh, strong and randomized password manager, uh, strong and randomized password, they do not find it easy and they're not satisfied with such system. But if you're having a system that can ease it for them, then they would be satisfied more. And then they found the system to be generally transparent and uh, secure and they trusted the system. And if we specifically look at the SUS scale, this is a usability scale uh, based on 10 standard questions that we ask the users how they feel, do they need a, uh, do they need a technical person to be there, um, do they find it easy, do they find it complex, and based on that we found the SUS score to be 79 which is translated to good acceptance of the system. So now we saw our password manager, let's also look at our uh, two-factor authentication. Um, that can even further improve the security of this password manager. So if you look at um, just single factor authentication, <coughs> and that's when you're only using your password to log into a system. This login with only password um, is always uh, not secure when that single factor is revealed somehow. It could be that uh, the attacker guesses in an online guessing, uh, or it might be that even in our case, in our password manager, if a malware is sitting on the client, it would finally know the, the result of all these secure protocol. So if that single password is revealed, we want to, even in that case, we want to make the system secure. And that's the reason that two-factor authentication is proposed in general. So two-factor authentication systems, they incorporate a user's personal com device, like for example, a smartphone or a security token or a security key, they incorporate this in the authentication process. Uh, and they're secure against online attack because now the attacker not only needs to know the password but also need to know the PIN that is generated per session. This combination makes the system more secure against online attacks. The attacker cannot just guess the password but guess the password and the PIN. But they are still not secure against offline attacks because <coughs> on the server side, still hash of the password is stored. And another component that we have here is the size of the pin. As we increase the size of the pin, the security of the system improves, uh, but it would be more difficult for the users to input a longer pin into their terminal. You might use a two-factor authentication. Some of them, they send you it four digits or six digit number to your um, application, like they may text you or you may open your application and, they, uh, and get that number. So if that number becomes a very long number, it would be more difficult to input it. And it's also not secure if someone looks at this channel because they can get the pin and immediately hijack the session and log into the user's account. And finally, they are not secure um, in terms that um, it's a sequential authentication. The user name and password is first entered, and then after that, the system asks if the username and password are correct, then they ask for the pin. So the attacker at this point would understand whether the username and password were correct or not. We wanted to have a system that addresses all these problems. And uh, we built this OPTFA, which is a secure two-factor authenticated key exchange scheme, uh, which has optimal security property. It's a combination of DPEG protocol that I introduced earlier, <clears throat> with an addition of a protocol called SAS-DFA. The SAS-DFA itself is TFA, 
two-factor authentication, um, and that's just generating a pin that can be generating a pin on the device that can be verified on the server. But it also has another protocol called SAS MA. The SAS MA protocol is short authenticated string message authentication. It's a protocol that authenticates a channel between the client and the device. And once this channel is authenticated, you can make sure that the client is not compromised. I'll show this protocol in a, in a second. This SAS MA protocol requires a user's validation of a checksum. So the protocol SAS MA runs between the client and the device. And the result of this protocol is a checksum at each side of the protocol, at the client side and the device side. And it asks the user to verify whether this checksum matches or no. So rather than having the user inputting a pin, here we replace it with the user just checking the equality of the checksum at two sides. Let's uh, look at the protocol a little bit more. This SAS MA protocol um, is a protocol running between the client and the device. Let's say the client is sending a message MC to the device. The device got this message, and you want to make sure that this MC has not been tampered on the way because this channel is not secure. So there might be a man in the middle attacker here on this channel. You want to make sure that this MC is equal to this MC here. The protocol anyways run between these two, but what is important here is that the result of this protocol is the checksum. The checksum is usually, let's say, a two-word um, string. Let's say it's apple orange. If the apple orange is shown on both sides, that means that the protocol is secure. A man in the middle didn't interfere with the protocol. If one side is receiving apple orange, the other is receiving apple stumble, that means that the protocol is not secure and it had been, the message had been tampered on the way from the client to the device. So now let's see that how we um, incorporate this in our two-factor authentication. Um, it, it may look a bit, I don't know, scary, but the protocol itself is not scary at all. What happens is that you send a nonce, um, from the server to the client. Based on this nonce, we are going to produce a pin. So that ZID is what we are going to produce the pin uh, with this input. And then this is transferred from the client to the device. And you want to make sure that it has not been changed or it has not been tampered and the client is not compromised. That's why we run the SAS MA protocol on the input of ZID and we also run the OPRF protocol, as I discussed earlier in our password manager. The OPRF protocol um, generates the randomized password, and this SAS MA protocol actually replaces the need for the user to input the PIN. So when this SAS MA runs, you can be sure if the checksum is equal on both sides, you can be sure that the client is not compromised. That means that the password that you input finally, or you generate on the client side is not, um, is not known to a malicious party. That's the reason that we are running this protocol. We want to make sure that the client is a valid client. And then finally, after the pin is generated and, uh, and you're sure that the client is not malicious, you just send the password along with the pin to the server. And this pin and password are transferred without the user being involved. So it's transferred automatically. It's not that the user does not need to input it. That's why you can make this pin as long as you want. And you can increase the security of the protocol in that way. We have the OPRF and PIG, same as our password manager. And we have the user validating the checksum here. So how does the user validate the, ch the checksum? One very simple way is that ask the user to compare and say that, is it correct or no? Is, does it match or no? Is it the same thing that you're seeing on both sides or no? But uh, studies have shown that users uh, often tend to say yes to whatever you show them. Uh, so we don't want to have this compare and confirm. Rather, we designed uh, several other type of device to client SaaS validation schemes. One of them is that we show the SaaS on one side, and we ask the user to input it on their device, and the device decides whether it's correct or no. But again, here you are inputting something, which might not be very easy. You can also capture a QR code showed on the 
client and the device capture it and can compare it um, internally with the one that com with the one that is computed uh, on the device and say whether the channel is secure or no. And also we have the audio, which is a cool um, feature that we added here. And then I also use this kind of audio-based uh, SAS validation in other type of um, crypto phones and like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and other things. So in, in these cases that the pin is shown or the SAS is shown on the, cl on the client and the user speaking and the device transform it to textual format by using transcription technology and then can compare it with the one that is computed locally. We also had a usability study of this one and we noticed that uh, the QR code offers the highest performance in terms of the delay that is imposed and um, it offers the highest level of usability. So overall, here I introduced a two-factor authentication that is secure against online guessing attack. It is secure against offline dictionary attack. It is secure against any part of the protocol being compromised, device being compromised, client being compromised, and server being compromised. So it offers the highest level of security. At the same time, it's much easier. And that's what I was talking about, that by incorporating different domains, we could achieve a protocol that is not only secure, but also offers a usability similar to password authentication. I also in, um, introduced our password manager that offers highest level of um, security uh, with respect to the server being compromised, the device being compromised, the password manager being compromised, and uh, the channel, even the channel does not need to be encrypted. So with that, um, I want to conclude this part of the technical talk, and you can ask me questions if you have. Um, and then after that, I'll just briefly talk about visa research. Okay, so um, yes. the, 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 what's, what's the name? The, the code? Uh, the yeah, the password for getting the credit is the visa. The V is a capital V. Uh, so that's important. Wait, what is it? Uh, it's visa. It's visa. It's a capital. So, so V is uppercase. Okay. So, uh, I guess so we can open the floor to questions. Yeah, but um, I encourage you not to leave the room because after that I will talk about what's happening at uh, Visa Research, and you might be interested in any of the projects, and you might want to apply for uh, internship or full time. So, yeah. Sure. But uh, but ask any technical question you have about. It. Man in the middle attack uh, on which channel? Uh, yeah. so on the channel between the client and the server? Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so all the time in all the protocols we are relying on the current technique which is TLS. The channel between the client, TLS or any paid protocol. So the channel between the client and the server is already secure. Uh, so how about the DS? How about the Uh, no, we don't have any protection for the DNS, but we incorporate the domain in generation of the password. So if the domain is not valid, the password that is generated, the output password, doesn't match the user's password. So you again, I can maybe have a region of the server and then the data.com domain to my fish website, right? So you are kind of like poisoning your DNS? Oh, uh, yes. the actual, the IP address match, but the domain name does not match the actual website's uh, address, right? No. It does match? So, so, I mean, so for example, I port the visa.com to another website, right? And then the user would see the visa.com. So which, which website does the user open? It's just the visa.com, but in fact, it's another server. Ah, oh, you're redirecting it to a different... Uh, 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 
up last year as a tax. Mm. We cannot hear a news that last year the DOS was a tax and users cannot visit Google or Twitter or something. So I'm wondering if we have protection, especially for the DOS. I assume that's not the attack that we were uh, concerned and considered in our third model. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, I guess that's a different, that's an yeah. uh, orthogonal question, I think. It's, it's that's, another layer. Yeah, that was not part of the authentication that we wanted to address. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's not, that's another question. Uh, are you guys considering uh, any sort of uh, two factor or even the, the, the first approach for, for protecting against single point compromise for biometrics? and? Um, we are considering that, but it would be a different problem, and actually we are working on that at Visa Research right now. It would be slightly different because uh, when your input is a biometric, then the features might change a little bit, yes. and in our OPRF protocol, that change of the features even slightly would generate a different uh, password. What we are looking at right now is fuzzy OPRF, which is uh, the new trend. Uh, and we are trying to incorporate the pass the biometrics in the system, like replacing the passwords with that kind of biometrics. Yeah, because that, then it's even I mean even more usable. It, yeah, and, and and for biometrics, it's even worse if the the service is compromised because then it cannot revoke. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's it's something that we are looking at at Visa Research, but um, at the theory level right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. What about device fingerprinting as an additional? So I, I know that some banks are now using device <coughs> fingerprinting as an additional you know, for the device that you're running the app on. And if you are going to an unknown device, you might have to jump through some additional hoops. Um, yeah, uh, that's something that we are not uh, considering right now. But it's an important uh, uh, it's, it's an important problem. Like if you're changing the device, then you have to switch the keys. This is something that we looked at our paper under submission that uh, let's not have a device and rather than a device let's say we have a central server and with that central server you don't even need to ask the user to carry their device or you don't need to ask the users to change their device it would be addressed that way only otherwise there should be a way to just shift all the protocol and all the keys from one device to another device but we are addressing that first with the online service and second, at Visa Research, we are looking at uh, threshold cryptography and having multiple devices or multiple, as I will say in, in a couple of slides, uh, um, we are looking at uh, having multiple of these devices uh, running in parallel. And in, co in collaboration, they generate the password rather than just one device generating the password. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's any other trade-offs here or if this largely just comes for free. So for instance, uh, the password manager that you have here. So it's secure against offline attacks, online attacks. It's also usable. Um, you, is there any extra hits you have to take in terms of, let's say, time yeah, complexity? The, as I was mentioning, one problem that we noticed is that the user may not have their device available. That's the problem with any kind of secondary factor or any kind of device enhanced protocol. Um, that's why we are looking at how we can switch it to online services that are more available. Like if my device runs out of battery, then what am I going to do? That would be the only problem that I was concerned and because of that we are doing this online version. And it has its own set of properties and its own set of challenges to be addressed once we switch to the online service. Are there more uh, questions? Don't be shy. I have another one. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to, to understand here if, if an adversary is able to compromise the device, which generates the, the random part of the key that's combined with the password, and observe the result of the. Take the key and observe the results, okay. Yeah, then, then it becomes as, uh, the same case as password guessing, as it if you didn't have a, anything. It would be the same uh, problem as your. Uh, let's say if you're using two-factor authentication, it would be the same as your second factor being compromised, and then you have to and guess the password. To, yeah. to the same. It gets back to the password guessing.
So I understand that you said that DPEG, in case of DPEG, we don't need to store the client side password in a NAV format to the, and that's why it's more secure because we never store it, we never transmit over the channel. So right. can we compare it with the self-generating keychains, which is a like highly cited paper where we just uh, establish one initial seed and then onward there is a self-generating keychain which will, which will be like self-authenticating keychain. And in that case, as I understand, we don't need, uh, because in this case, if we uh, n times, we need to re verify a password, we need n transactions. Yeah. Or n Each processing of the defect. Yeah. yeah, but in case of self-generating keychains, I think we don't need that, and still we don't store the key at the server side. So mm. can we compare it? You mean that? at the server side or at the device side? At the server side. Like, I'm just trying to understand, can we draw a comparison, or is it like on different sides? I think it would be different because what we are trying to address is that we don't want any modification on the server because we want the system to be practical and be ready to, de to be deployed. Um, like in that case, you have to go and change the servers. And what we, what we were trying to do is to not to touch the server. Whatever we do on the device side or on the client side is fine, but we wanted not to change the server. So maybe that the DPEG module does it reside on the extended Chrome browser or it resides on the server? The DPEG module. Uh, the DPEG that takes two DPEG can have any PEG protocol that is there. The PEG protocol might be something like as simple as TLS. Uh, which is the thing that we use for our password manager, or it might be a page protocol that you developed for yourself. That's why, I mean, one part of this protocol is that we want this protocol to be modular. So if we change the server, we don't want the whole system to change. Or if we change one part of that, we don't want to. I mean, we want to just plug and play different protocols. The page protocol can be any page protocol. But we it want resides to have at the sessions. server? But it resides at the server. The PEG protocol is a protocol between the client and the server. I mean, I mean it, it doesn't execute reside. at the server or the client side. When Both. it takes two inputs, it has to be at either side. So I'm just trying to understand. It's uh, it's at both. It's like this, the same OPRF. Uh, it's oblivious. It's uh, like one of the PEG protocols that we have is both sides. They collaborate, and they can generate the key on each side individually. It's not, uh, the, the final result is not generated uh, on any of them solely, but it's uh, on both of them. That's one of the PEG protocols that we have. So, okay, I have a question. So, yeah, I've saved that one, but like for myself. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm wondering from a different perspective, not technical, but, but, but more from the tech transfer uh, perspective. So, 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 so your work is definitely so. So, so it's definitely it's better than the thing I am using that that today for the for the for the, uh, for the Spinex. I think it's definitely it's better than the last pass I use now. So, so, so which actually store my password and also uh, doesn't have the the, the properties like you so you have. And also your your solution also doesn't really require change of the of the server side. So I think it's 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 uh, it's really like like deployable. Yeah. Um, so what? What do you think? Um, so, so maybe it's, it's it's better. So, so I'm thinking about why people are not re not really so using that, or it's actually so. What is that case that is actually undergo like a tech transfer and and then something? We started a pattern about it, and uh, we are trying to do that. But you know, uh, we were mainly uh, in academia. We were looking at the protocol itself, not yeah. not a fully deployed and mature uh, engineering part of that. There are still problems that are not address or not, uh, I mean it is addressable, but we didn't address right now. Like for example, if the user have multiple accounts or if they want to share their uh, passwords with their spouse, there are several um, small things uh, that are currently addressed in mature technologies, like for example, LastPass, that we still need to have them. So we didn't think about that part because it was not, uh, it was not a research problem for us. That's interesting, but but, but as yeah, you can see, that's another so level of trade-off, right? So it's like so 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 like in the real world, people are using things, you know, in various different ways, and and then so probably we we are we are getting we, we are we are pushing things to to like to to like the practical side. So there's all sorts of this. I think it things. is it can be practical, but it needs uh, some kind of engineering to make the right, system right. ready to. 
exactly, exactly. But I mean, I use it, but I, I use it because I know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, because as a novel user, I, I, I actually really want to replace that with my current, like, like, like last pass. I don't want them to know my password. Yeah. It's definitely not so true. Yeah. So, okay. So, so I quickly, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, has are there any plans of Visa to incorporate uh, these two factor authentication uh, schemes into the day to day transactions? Uh, they are looking at, uh, yeah, they are looking at uh, collaboration with Fido Alliance and they are looking at uh, two factor authentication. Some part of that would be at Visa and part of that that would be at Visa Research is uh, how we can have new protocols and new models that are more secure compared to the current one. But yeah, they, they are looking at that. Uh, so it would be a two-factor authentication, but the authentication would happen locally on your device. Uh, let's say in, uh, in FIDO, uh, what, what happens is that uh, you have a secondary device and you use that device to generate the pin or actually sign a challenge sent by, by the server. But to make sure that it's <coughs> actually the user who is transferring this, you need a kind of local authentication. And this is something that they are looking at. And I'll show another uh, project that they are looking at in a second. What do you mean by local authentication? Is this Meaning this that you authenticate, let, let's say if you're using your Apple phone and you're using Touch ID to log into your Wells Fargo app. So that's kind of like a local authentication to your phone rather than authentication to the Wells Fargo account, right? Um, that kind of local authentication to your phone so that your phone verifies you, and then based on that, the transaction is secure between your phone and an external party. Yeah. So uh, you said that like, if the, 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 the two-factor authentication part, the most cumbersome part is where you have to have your user to like, scan the QR code or do some kind, some kind of a voice authentication. Is there any chance that you can use like some kind of a trusted uh, execution uh, environment like the uh, like the arm trust zone or something like that to do oh like yeah the, but something it, the like uh, automatic between the mm -hmm. two two phones or, or the device because so uh, it can be a trusted uh, out of band channel so because your channel is assumed to be uh, controllable by the attacker the channel between the device and client the assumption is that it can be controlled by the attacker. So any trusted secondary channel could be used. And that's why we are using, let's say, human voice, because user's voice can be authenticated. Or we, or we are using, let's say, user capturing something, because in the presence of the users, that channel can be authenticated. So any kind of secondary channel that is trusted and authenticated can be used. Uh, uh, and, and another layer of challenge is deployment. Because if you want to put something into Trust Zone, it's not something that any app can just, just do that. You need to tell the manufacturers to build a distrusted app into the secure world. That's that's another sort of layer of that challenge. Right. Yeah. Okay. I understand, like, uh, for the app part, like, for the spending, for the password manager, like, since there is no, like, password store in the app, so it's secure for uh, offline attack. But mm -hmm. In the extreme case, like both ser service, the server and the, the phone, like they're from the same manufacturer, they're both uh, compromised. Mm -hmm. Then it is possible for this service, for the adversary to reveal the pass, uh, with reveal the users. Uh, uh, the master password? No, you cannot reveal the master password. Uh, uh, how do you get the master password? No, from? I mean it's uh, because they, for the server is compromised. So he got the random password. Right, but yeah. from the randomized password, you cannot go back to master password. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming if the device is also uh, The device is also compromised, yes, I understand it. Then, but like both the key, the key and the random password is known. Yeah, so the good thing is that even if the key is, uh, is known and the randomized password is known, mm -hmm. the randomized password is not used elsewhere, right? And the master password cannot be uh, derived from the randomized password. That's why you cannot attack a different uh, server. Uh, That's the is point. that the reason? Because like the random password is generated generated from both um, the key, the key and, and the, the master password. Oh. Yeah, and it's not you don't know you cannot uh, revert it. Right, I guess uh, I can always uh, that computer in the 
if you can. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, definitely, I definitely have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah so let different. me just yeah. uh, wrap this in, um, in, in a few minutes, maybe five minutes, and say what we are doing at Visa Research. As I said, uh, there are three research areas, data analytics, security, and blockchain. Um, data analytics actually was the main reason that Visa Research was formed. They were formed with only data analytics, and then security was added. They have um, uh, fraud detection models, and they have some recommendation systems. They have travel recommendation, fashion recommendation, and um, something else. Travel, fashion, something. Recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> what recommendation? What can you recommend? <laughs> Restaurant recommendation. So because Visa has access to this huge volume of data and they know the transaction, based on the transaction that they got, they can recommend different things. So one of them was restaurant. Um, it makes sense that the data is evolving. Uh, initially, Visa had access only to, let's say, the account number and the time stamp, but now there are more information coming, biometrics, geolocation, all this information. And also the new models are out there in machine learning. So it makes sense to have different type of applications that uses these data and these models to build applications. One of these applications is fraud detection. Um, this is actually a graph of a fraud that connects each consumer to the merchant and to the bank. And once the and you can, if one of them is fraudulent, you can see in this graph. That's a graph from our data team. Um, they have this fraud detection um, model that gets the uh, features from the uh, gets gets the features from the transaction sequence and uh, builds a model based on LSTM um, that can detect whether a transaction is fraudulent or a merchant is fraudulent or not. Um, so that that's all I know about this. And if you have questions, I can just connect you to people. Uh, but the other thing that I know is that it is very important for Visa to understand whether a transaction. Um, is detected correctly as a fraud or no, not just because they want to say that, okay, we are secure, because they are secure, but more importantly is that if um, a transaction mistakenly is considered as fraud, that would be a loss of money for them. So they are very careful to detecting, to accurate, accurately detecting that a transaction is a fraud or is not a fraud. Um, currently, they know that they are secure, and that's why it's a brand, but it's also important to be usable so that the users keep using it, uh, rather than just getting denied because of some uh, malfunction of their model. In the cryptography research, they have uh, secure multi-party computation, threshold cryptography, post-quantum computing, and searchable encryption, and others. So as I said, uh, we are um, having an extremely valuable data, and what if we also have a complementary data from other merchants and banks and other parties in the communication? But the problem is that some of these data uh, cannot be sent directly to Visa because of privacy concerns, because of, because of some restriction and regulation. So we want to know if we can have systems that use each of these data but the data doesn't reveal to other parties, but the data um, at each of these locations in a multi-party communication can be used to build models that uh, can be used again for applications such as fraud detection or recommendation system. Um, the paper that they had at uh, IEEE S&P 2017 showed that they could have a, a thousand times faster model uh, working on this private data, and next week they are going to present the other papers um, at CCS. They have, I think, three, four papers at CCS. One of them would be about uh, multi-party communication for machine learning. They are also working on distributed cryptography to keep the keys secure even when it is in use. In the system security research, we are interested in various topics, including uh, verifiable computing, IoT authentication, and many other things. So one of the things that I wanted to show you is uh, using, uh, using multiple IoT devices, such as smartwatch or phone, or any other smart devices that the user has, give, give each of them a trust score, and use them in authenticating the payment uh, transactions. And that was a question that someone was asking that 
are they are they looking at uh, two-factor authentication? So what they are trying to do is that uh, based on the behavior of my device, give a trust score to my device, and using that trust score, authenticate a payment transaction. In the blockchain research, um, rather than focusing on the currency itself and looking at the application, we are looking at the protocols. That how we can have protocols that are um, faster and provide more privacy and better accountability. One of the papers that is going to be again presented at CCS 2018 shows that uh, what we could achieve is that by increasing the number of the nodes in a blockchain, net, in, a, in a Bitcoin uh, network, uh, we can actually have a higher performance. This is in contrast to the current Bitcoin networks that uh, when the no number of nodes increases, the performance actually decreases. And as I said, we are uh, hiring about 30 research scientists and we are hiring interns. Um, this would be at Visa Research, we are mainly uh, hiring uh, PhD students and PhD graduates, but Visa also uh, has several opportunities for research for other masters and bachelor's students and uh, uh, recent graduates. Uh, check our website at research.visa.com to know about what we are doing and email us at this one, research at visa.com, if you are interested in any of the positions that you see. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.